of California, on behalf of standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If you have something that must be handled with complete confidence, then you need me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, hatred between brothers is an old and tragic story. More tragic in my case because in all the years we haven't seen each other, my brother Phil hasn't been exactly a model of virtue. I feel I'm at least partially responsible and I'd like to make it up to him somehow. I think I finally see him. Finally succeeded in locating him, but at this point I need your help. You can reach me at the Hotel Stapleton. And it's signed, Sincerely Yours, Martin Bettner. Hmm. Gosh, I think in a way this is, well, touching. One brother realizing his error and trying oh, to... Oh, Brooksy, you're a dyed-in-the-wool sentimentalist. I bet you still have your first doll and your first dance program stashed away somewhere. Yes, along with some other sentimental relics I've collected since I met you. Oh? A blackjack, an old and faded poison pen letter, one sawed-off <laughs> touché, shotgun... Touché, Angel, touché. <laughs> now, what do you say we call this Mr. Bettner at the Stapleton and see just what he has on his mind? I called you in, Mr. Valentine, because, well, in a way, you're my neighbor. Uh, what do you mean by that, Mr. Bettner? Well, look here, uh, Mr. Valentine, Miss Brooks. Yes? Uh, here in the personal notice column in the paper, your ad is just under mine. Oh, yes, now I remember your ad. You've been running this for a week or so. That's right, Miss Brooks. <laughs> I just didn't tie it up with your letter. Oh, uh, let me see that. Uh, Philip, let's forget the past. If you'll meet me halfway, we can make up for all that bitterness. Uh, there's even a place waiting for you in the family business. I'm at the stable in Martin Bettner. You said you'd located your brother, Mr. Bettner. He must have gotten in touch with you. I said I think I've located my brother. But if Phil has seen my ad, uh, he hasn't answered it. I got only one reply from a uh, Renee Clemens. Uh, take a look at it, Mr. Valentine. Uh-huh. What does it say, George? Uh-huh. Well, it seems Miss Clemens knows where Phil Bettner, quote, the rat, unquote, is now holed up. She's willing to part with that information for a price figure to be arrived at. Well, what's the problem, Bettner? Well, back in Waynesville, I know my way around, but here in this town, like a fish water. Back home, I've got my own hardware business. I know everybody to look at, and they know me, but here it's different. Oh, I see. Well, why don't you just drive the best bargain you can with this gal, pay her off with a dated check, then see if her information is the real thing. Oh, it, it isn't just the money. I don't know the kind of people Phil's been associating with in the last five years. This could be some kind of trap. Feel an awful lot better if you came along with me to see this, Miss Clemens. All right, good enough. But look, Bettner, you've been hinting that your brother has been operating a little on the uh, shady side. Well, I'm afraid so. Well, then the police could tell you where he was, just like that, if you got in touch with them. I checked. Phil has no police record, thank heavens. He's been mixed up in gambling, mostly horse racing, and so far he's been lucky. Two weeks ago, some people in Detroit told me he left for here, and that's all I know. Well, assuming Miss Clemens is a local girl, your brother must have worked pretty fast to make such a, an indelible impression in two weeks. I don't know what to think. But I've got to find Phil and talk to him. Well, first, let's have a talk with Renee. She may know whereof she speaks, but I'm afraid her price won't be reasonable. It'll cost you 500 bucks. Now, wait a minute, sister. The name is Miss Clemens. And I should up the price, seeing that all of a sudden I'm dealing with three people. Uh, please, Miss Clemens, I asked Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine, to come along with me. Five hundred bucks. But Mr. Bettner only wants his brother's address. He doesn't want to make a down payment on the house. Oh, I see we've got a Vassar girl here. All right, ladies, enough of this banter. The price is too high, Miss Clemens. Sorry. Come on, Bettner. Uh, yes, Let's get I... going. Uh, no, uh, wait a minute. Well? What uh, kind of a deal would you go for? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I'll be lavish with Mr. Bettner's money. Two fifty cash. I have that much right here with me. What do you say? Well, Miss Brooks still doesn't seem to approve of the price. <laughs> All I can say is you're lucky you're dealing with men. Yeah, some girls are lucky to have what it takes to get what they want. All you've got is an address, and it's not even your own. Listen here, you Break little... clean, girls. Two hundred and fifty dollars, Miss Clemens. All right. Let's have it. Certainly. 
Here you are. Now, where can I find my brother? It's 356 Morano Street. A grimy, broken-down rooming house. It's so dark you need a seeing-eyed dog to get up the stairs. I got you. Just a cottage small by a waterfall. Thanks. We'll find our way. Just be sure you tell him Rene sent you. <laughs> I wish I could be there to see the look on his face. Well, if you know Philip is so dead set against getting in touch with me, why are you doing this? Mm, let's be charitable and say I wouldn't mind if he dropped dead. And it'd be a pleasure to spend the 250 bucks on flowers for his funeral. Oh, I knew she had a kind heart. Well, we may as well be going, Valentine. I know if I can just speak to Phil, everything will be all right. Yeah, 356 Moreno Street, eh, Miss Clemens? You heard me. That better be Phil Bettner's place. Or you'll find his brother is just an Indian giver. Get what I mean? This is it. Number seven. He's got his card tacked up on the door. Hmm. Philip Bettner. Investments. Huh. Who's kidding whom? Well, this is worse than I thought. Well, looks like nobody's home. We'll wait right here till he comes back. I don't think that'll be very comfortable. Uh, do you mind paying for a lock, Bettner? What? What do you mean, George? Just this. Wait a minute. Please sit down. Oh, golly, where's the window? This place hasn't been aired out in a week. <laughs> the eternal feminine. I I don't know what I'll say to Philip. I don't want to hurt his pride. Uh-huh. What have you got there, Valentine? Well, it looks like this desk is your brother's investment office. His favorite and only investment being horses. I knew it was something like that. What's up, darling? December 20th, $2,000, Henning. January 3rd, 3500 Henning, et cetera, et cetera. And all to Henning. What's that supposed to mean? No wonder your brother Phil is living in a dump like this. From the way this stacks up, he owes about 25 grand to Lou Henning. Oh, George. Well, wait a minute, Angel. You see, Bettner, this character Lou Henning is the big shot bookie in this town. You don't go around owing him 25,000 bucks for too long. Oh. George, please. I was just trying to explain to Bettner. What's the matter with you, Brooksy? That. that red spot under the closet door. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? What's wrong? It's all dried up. Blood, George? It's not red ink. What do you think that could be? Henning has his own way of collecting debts. Well, there's one sure way to find out. <gasps> yeah. That's not Phil. Who is it? This, my friend, is Lou Henning. Just about as dead as you can get with a knife stuck in your back. Phil wouldn't do a thing like this. He might have been a lot of things, but he's not a killer. I wouldn't know, Brooksy. Yes, George. There's no phone here. Beat it down the corner and call Lieutenant Johnson. Oh, I won't mind getting out of here at all. Valentine, couldn't we close that closet door? Sorry. From now on, we can't touch anything. Oh. I, uh... I suppose the police will just take it for granted that Phil did this killing. What would you think in their place? I guess you're right. Now, but... look, Bradner, I'm not saying your brother did this. But as soon as Henning's mob finds out what's happened, they're going to jump to their own conclusions. What I'm trying to say is, let's hope the police find him first. I see. Uh, Valentine. Yeah? You're still working for me, aren't you? I was, but things are a little different now. No, they aren't. You You still have to find my oh, brother. Hold on. Wait a find minute. Find him before he's shot down in cold blood. But the police at least will have a chance to explain all this, if there is an explanation. You're putting me on a tight rope, Bettner. The police on one side, Henning's boys on the other. If it's a question but, of money, whatever you say... Looks like I... Henning's been in that closet a couple of days. It's not going to be easy picking up your brother's trail. I'm not asking you to promise me anything, but, but try, will you? Okay. Okay, it's a deal. But if Henning's mob gets to Phil first, that Clemens dame will be spending that 250 on flowers for your brother's funeral. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about gears. Most folks just couldn't say whether the gears in their cars are spur, worm, spiral, or hypoid, but... The men at Standard Stations and at independent Chevron gas stations know the minute you drive in. And because there are so many different kinds of gears in today's cars, 
All these service stations carry a variety of lubricants to meet their special needs. RPM lubricants. Each one tailor-made to carry away heat, to keep gears shifting easily, to do a better wear-saving job. Make sure you get an RPM lubricant next time you get that 5,000-mile change for your transmission and differential gears. While you're at the independent Chevron gas station or standard station, ask for a free copy of Batter Up, the new illustrated handbook on baseball. It's a gift to you from the service stations that say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Am I my brother's keeper? Martin Bettner thought so and hired George to help him locate his black sheep brother, Philip. But when they arrived in Phil Bettner's room, they found a body in the closet. The body of Lou Henning, a big shot bookie. George has just sent Claire to the corner drugstore to call Lieutenant Johnson. Be reasonable, Bettner. I promised you I'd look for your brother, but I can't leave until Lieutenant Johnson gets here. He's going to have an awful lot of questions to ask. But Phil won't have a chance if Lou Henning's men get to him first. You said so yourself. I know, I know. All right, there's one thing I will do, though. Make a phone call. I think I know just the character who might be able to give me a lead on Phil. I'll be back in a few minutes. Oh, say, I I just remembered. I think I saw a phone down in the hall when we came in. You could have thought of that before. I wouldn't be calling you, Odd Boats, if I wasn't willing to pay for the information. Yeah, the name's Bettner, Phil Bettner. Doesn't mean anything to you, huh? Now look, Odd Boats, you're my favorite pawnbroker. You know everything that goes on in this part of town. He's probably hiding out. Okay, I'll drop around your place in an hour or so. Hey, what goes here? Hey, Bettner, open the door so we can have some light out here in the hall, will you? Come on, before I break my neck. Hold it. Hold it. Hey, wait a minute. I... You stay right there by the head of the stairs, George, till I put on this light. Never mind that, Angel. Open the door. George! Uh, Mr. Bettner, he's... Yeah. Looks like he got the same treatment I did. Hey, see how he is, will you, Brooksy? I couldn't bend down now to pick up a thousand-dollar bill. Mr. Bettner! Mr. Bettner, are you all right? Oh. Good. At least he's making a noise. George, he was knocked out, too. Uh, it... It was Phil. I... I was standing there, and he... He came in the door and then... Let me help you get up, Mr. Petner. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Are you sure it was Phil? I I tried to talk to him, but he picked up that desk lamp and hit me with it. You better sit down. Thank you. Your brother. So that's the one who threw me down the stairs. Why did he come back? What was he looking for? Valentine, at least we know that Phil can't be very far from here. That should help you find him. I mean, you're still interested in finding that brother of yours? He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't even give me a chance to talk to him. You stay here in the hall, Hennessy. Okay, Lieutenant. Say, what is this? The St. James Infirmary? Oh, Lieutenant Johnson. Yeah, I get your point, Lieutenant. Bettany here and I took a little uh, worse for the wear. But we managed to outlive the corpse. Where is it, Valentine? Over there. Yeah, what do you know? It is Henny. Let you in on a little secret, Miss Brooks. I didn't believe you when you called me. Why do you think I kept screaming at you over the phone? Ah. Uh, oh, Hennessy. Yeah, Lieutenant? Get the fingerprint, boys, and the photographer, and we'll go to work. Yes, sir. Still can't believe it. Believe what? Lou Henning with his $25 silk shirts, and look at him. Folded up like a jackknife in the bottom of a closet in a crummy rooming house and killed by a cheap little gambler. Oh, Lieutenant, I don't think you heard. This is Philip Bettner's brother, Martin. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that's all right. Lieutenant, I I know there's only one thing you can think, but I still insist my brother didn't kill this man. Look, I may as well tell you, Mr. Bettner, we've got a general alarm out for your brother. 
Yes. I suppose, as usual, Mr. Valentine, you've got an altogether different theory about this thing. On the contrary, Lieutenant. I'm in complete agreement with you for once. Well, we dropped Bettner off safely at the Stapleton, and I bought you a nice, juicy hamburger. So now, out you go, Brooksy. You know what you're supposed to do. Yes, George. But you don't know what you're asking of me. Rene brings out the fishwife in me. The Black Mariah will be taking us both away. Go on, now, Angel. That gal in there didn't tell us half what she really knows. Maybe because you do rub her the wrong way, we can find out some more. Well, okay. And when you're through, wait for me in the lobby of the stapling. Mm-hmm. If I don't get there, I'll give you a call. Mm-hmm. He's so good to me. Well, now for Rene. Wish I'd let my fingernails grow. Uh, yes, miss? What, but... Well, well. Now all you have to do is whistle. Yeah? And I'll send you my grandfather's OU kid button. Huh? Oh, never mind, Bogart. Get on your switchboard and call Miss Clemens. Tell her I'm coming up to see her. Sorry, miss. She just left. Um... I'll be leaving in an hour myself. Does that uh, mean anything to you? Listen, Junior. Did Miss Clemens say where she was going, and was there anybody with her? Sorry, I don't know a thing about the affairs of our tenants. Oh, I get it. Oh, now, a bright, good-looking boy like you must notice everything. I could tell that the way you looked at me as soon as I came in. Well, knowing yourself as you do, can you blame me, Clemens? Oh, if you keep saying those things, you're going to spoil me, sure thing. <laughs> uh, the name's Tommy. Yes, Thomas. Now, about Miss Lemon. Uh, she left about five minutes before you came in. She had a couple of bags with her. She was with a big, tall guy. Yes, Tommy? He had kind of wavy hair, and uh, I, I think she called him Phil. Huh? Oh, that's fine, Tommy. That's just what I wanted to know. How can I ever thank you? Well, I told you I'll be off in an hour. Uh, uh, say, uh, wait, uh, what was your name again? I'll mail it to you on your 21st birthday. And that's a promise, Tommy. <laughs> Now, look, Godfoss, why are you making like a clam all of a sudden? <laughs> Is that what I was doing? Oh, don't give me that. You've been selling information about people for years. Why the sudden... Oh, I get it. You already know about Lou Henning. So, uh, who doesn't? Now, look, Valentine. Why don't you forget you ever heard of Phil Bettner? If I'm afraid to talk to you, who will? <laughs> Side pocket, three ball. Uh, sorry to interrupt your pool game, friend, but Whitey Sanderson said you might know where I might find Phil. Look, brother, you're a stranger to me. Let's keep it that way. Okay, boys, here's the last race. Hialeah. Queen Meg. Win, 880, place 663, 40 for show. Say, mister, hey, tell me you're looking for information. Who told you? Oh, word gets around. It's about PB, ain't it? Yeah, that's right. You got anything I can use? If you're willing to pay for it. What do you say they step up out here? All right, come on, give. You know, you took the words right out of my mouth, mister. Okay. Okay, mister. Here's five tens. And don't try chiseling for more because it won't work. I wouldn't do this to my best friend, except I had a bad day at the track. Never mind that. Now, where do I find Phil Bettner? Twenty-two and a half Jackson Place. <laughs> Okay, Valentine. I got your call. Where's Phil Bettner? Uh, mm. Yeah, Lieutenant, that's your boy. What's left of him? So Henning's mob did catch up with him first. That's about as neat a job as I've ever seen. Yeah. It's been right cozy sitting here waiting for you. I know. You lead an awful tough life, Valentine. Look, we're going to get him down to the morgue. You get his brother down there to identify him. Yeah, I'll do that. You don't mind if I make a telephone call first. What for? I promised Brooksy faithfully I wouldn't leave her sitting in that lobby all night. And he's on his way to the morgue, Brooksy. 
Central, see? So that just about washes it up. Then I suppose what I wanted to tell you isn't too important now. Rene left her apartment with Phil a few hours ago. Yeah, yeah, but look, Angel, tell Martin Bettner to meet me at headquarters. He has to identify his brother. But don't tell him why. I'll take care of that myself. Well, sorry, George, you're going to have to call him yourself. Huh? I just saw something walk across the lobby, and I'm going to follow what it. What are you talking about? Tell you about it later, Angel. I'll be seeing you. Going somewhere, Miss Clemens? Oh, the Vassar girl again. Yeah. Now, look, dearie, how about you and me going to the morgue together? What are you talking about? Oh, they'll probably want to ask you some questions about Phil. And I'd hate to see you take this bus and have to come all the way back. I'm taking this bus. You're just making things very difficult. And what are you going to do about it? Oh, I'm just going to tear your hair out and scream all over the place. Then they'll slap us both in jail for disorderly conduct. And the jail is right next door to the morgue. You wouldn't dare. Oh, no? Ah, stop it! Hmm? Okay, you win. I knew you'd be reasonable. <laughs> Where's that client of yours anyway, Valentine? Please, Lieutenant, be compassionate. Yeah. I just told Bettner his brother's lying here in the morgue. He's having a cup of black coffee. He'll be here in a minute. Oh. Uh, Swanson. Yes, Lieutenant? Got the tag on Bettner all filled out? Just got through making it down. Bettner, Philip, age 36, Caucasian, height 6 foot 2, weight 190, identifying marks of any... Right arm withered, appendicitis scar, port wine bookmark of the left knee. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Where have you got him? Down the aisle there, number 302. Mm. When you get through identifying him, let me know and I'll put him away. Come on, Valentine. Hmm? Oh, sure, sure, Lieutenant. Now, don't tell me this place is getting you down. A tough-minded character like you. Oh, no, no, I was just thinking. Yeah, let's see, 302... Right down there, sir. I think they're waiting for you now. Hmm? Thank you. Oh, there's Bettner now. Yeah. Are you okay now? Yes, I I think so. Could we make this as quick as possible? I know, I know, of course. Just necessary routine. Here. Is this your brother? Yes, that's Phil. Well, that's all there is to it, Mr. Bettner. We'll just put the sheet back over Lieutenant Johnson, he's down there, Miss. Oh, come Could in, I miss stop him. this way, Miss Clemens? Now what gives? Yeah, what is it, Brooksy? Look who I found, George. Well, we meet again, Miss Clemens. So that's what you saw walking across the lobby. Who is this? She's the young lady who gave us the information about my brother. Oh. Well, you might as well identify him too, Miss, just for the record. Oh, oh Phil, Phil. I guess that clinches it. <gasps> I tried to tell him he wouldn't have a chance against Henning, but he wouldn't listen to me. How am I going to go on without him? I can't. Isn't this a sudden reversal, Miss Clemens? Not long ago, you were willing to sell him out to his brother for $250. Yes, and even spend that money on flowers for his funeral. What's that? I didn't know what I was saying. I was sore. I, I guess I loved him too much. He said he was going to walk out on me, and I... Well, that's why I... I answered that ad of yours, Mr. Bettner. It doesn't really matter now, does it? Lieutenant Johnson, I suppose I can call down here and make all the necessary arrangements about the body. Just talk to Swanson, that's all. I'd like Phil to be buried in Waynesville in the family plot. Don't worry about a thing. You don't look too well. You better get back to your hotel, get some rest. I'll see you about the bill before I leave, Valentine. Oh, we won't have to wait for it that long. I got it for you right now. Hey, Ryan, hey, 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 what are you doing? Yes, I didn't make myself very clear. Oh, George, um, did you hurt what's him? What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? Come on, come on, get up, Bettner. Hey, hey, what's the idea? Uh-huh, a nice 38 you're packing, bub. Is this what you mean by the hardware business? Well, are you going to do some talking, or do I have to knock your ears off with this gun? Phil, don't let him. Shut up, you fool. Yes, baby. It is Phil. What's that? Then who's this guy on the slab? Martin Bettner, I think, huh, George? Right, Brooksy. And what do you got to say to that, Phil? Nothing. Okay, then I'll put the words in your mouth. You had a fight with Henning and you killed him. 
Who knew that between the Post and Henning's boys, you were as good as dead? Oh, Phil. But you also knew your brother, Martin, was in town looking for you, the brother you always hated. So you got in touch with him, killed him in gangster style in that room on Jackson Place, then hired me for this fancy runaround. You don't know what you're talking about. It's beginning to make sense to me. Go on, Valentine. You outsmarted yourself, Phil. You should never have put that light out and thrown me down those stairs. You see, that's something Martin couldn't have done in a million years. Why? Well, what do you see for yourself? About... His right arm. We heard the report of Swanson. There was nothing wrong with Phil. But Martin Bettner had a withered arm. Oh, I wonder, Brooksy, why is it that when brothers hate each other, it's worse than all the Hatfields and the McCoys locked in one closet? Didn't you suspect anything about Phil before Swanson read that tag at the morgue? Well, when that character in the book he joined sidled up, volunteering information, it was a little too good to be true. You mean Phil planted him there? Uh-huh. But, sweet face, blood is thicker than water. Brothers should love each other. Well, I, think... I thought it was pretty unfeminine for Renee to rat on Phil one moment, then leave with him the way Tommy told me she did. You didn't even listen to me, did you, when I was telling you about that on the phone? Well, uh, maybe with one ear. Then when I saw her in the lobby of the same hotel where Martin was staying, well, I had a hunch, too. Oh, of course, it wasn't one of those scientific hunches you get. Yeah, yeah. But about brothers, Brooksy, do you think it's familiarity that sometimes breeds such man? Oh, not necessarily. Now, look at husbands and wives. They go on for years and years living together. Well, they never think of murdering each other. (laughs) Oh, Brooksy, you just haven't lived. And now, a message of importance to motorists. Can you imagine our friend George Valentine driving into a station and saying his car needed oil? Uh Uh-uh. You wouldn't catch George that way. He'd be sure to specify RPM motor oil, the great modern lubricant that's tailor-made to keep cars young. And if you consider your car an important investment, be sure you say RPM motor oil. RPM contains special compounds, and each added ingredient does a specific wear-saving job for your engine. It's a premium motor oil that stops rust, foaming, and corrosion, keeps your entire engine system cleaner. No wonder RPM motor oil is the two-to-one choice over any other motor oil in the West. Get it tomorrow at a standard station or an independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... George, do you think if Dr. Wormsley is right and he did see a man pushed off the roof, he'd be... Nothing like checking, Brooksy. Now, wait a minute. The rim is behind that high board fence and only windows from the elevator shafts on this side of the building. That would mean that... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Huh? Huh? George! That's a man. I mean, it was. Yeah. Past tense is putting it mildly. Well, Brooksy, it wasn't just Dr. Wormsley's imagination. And the odds are this is the body of our Mr. Dunlap. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Ken Christie appears as Lieutenant Johnson. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Gloria Blondell, Carlton Cadell, Tyler McVeigh, Harry Bartell, Bill Bissell, and Stanley Waxman. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.